Good evening to each of you. I welcome you here to North Stone Baptist Church. Go ahead and stand, if you would, please. While they were singing, not what my hands have done, uh, I was mindful of what it says in Titus 3, 5, that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. And they have started our service off uh, in a right way, in a gospel-heavy uh, uh, way, in a way that helps us to have a gospel perspective. So with that in mind, would you join me in prayer? So Father, we are sinners, and even uh, righteousness that we would try to exude on our own is merely filthy rags. It's, it's not about what our hands have done, uh, but it is according to your mercy that you save us. And so Father, thank you that those of us that know Jesus as Savior, we are positionally forgiven, positionally robed in Christ's righteousness. Father, help us to marvel at the gospel this evening and help us to walk in the implications of the gospel. It is with the gospel in view that we now get to sing these hymns of praise to you and get to fellowship with your people and we get to study your word and give to your cause. We dedicate afresh the service, the time that is before us to you, to your honor and glory. We recognize that Christ has purchased this church with his blood, and he is building this church according to his will, and we want Christ to have the preeminence here. And so, Father, thank you in advance for what you will do. Thank you for what you have done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn to number 736 this evening. We're going to be singing some choruses, so we'll probably sing them through twice. Uh, the first one tonight is, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Pastor, his prayer mentions about the mercies of God that we receive every day. His mercies are new every morning, and we should be willing to sing about that. And so would you join me as we sing this first time on, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. <laughs> I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. My faithful Lord, I rejoice. My faithful Lord, I singing this one, uh, uh, going to Youth for Christ meetings uh, when I was a teenager, written about that time in 1961. So uh, join me again as we sing on, I will sing of the, mer and sing it like you mean it tonight, Amen. all right? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever.
Uh, number uh, 734, sorry, 734, just back a couple pages. I know who holds the future. We'll sing this through twice. Ushers, if you would come down the second time as we sing this, if it's relatively short, so come down on that second. I know who holds the future. ago, and some of you were at Pensacola Christian College when Al Smith came and sang. How many of you were there? When he came two different times. Al Smith came. He, start, he was known as Mr. Saintspiration. Up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, had a publishing firm that published a lot of hymns. This hymn that was based on him that he put together, and so you can see down at the bottom that this was copyright in 1947. I wasn't alive then, but I think Herb was. Uh, <laughs> I was close. Uh, Sinspiration music, he was just known as Mr. Sinspiration, and he could really communicate. He wrote choruses like this that were so easy to sing that were doctrinally very sound. So you join me as we sing this again, ushers, if you would come down. I know the walls of future. Father, we thank you that you are the God of miracles. You are the one that we can trust to help us through difficulties that we come across. And things don't happen just by chance in our life. You have divinely planned these things. Lord, I pray that as the, the tithes and offerings are taken tonight, they would be used for your honor and your glory, not only here in Pensacola, but around the world. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Our scripture reading for today is going to be in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is where our scripture reading is. Um, and so how we're going to do this is starting in verse 12, I'm going to read every even verse because we're going to read this responsively, and every odd verse finishing at verse 17, you guys collectively will read. So once you've made your way to Colossians chapter 3, please stand with me in respect for the reading of God's word. Starting in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, we read, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for this opportunity we have to gather and just to hear your word and to be able to give glory to you in this service, Lord. I pray as we hear these words that we could apply them to our lives, just understanding that through your word and through your spirit, we can put off and mortify the deeds of our flesh, Lord, and be renewed and be able to put on these thoughts of forgiveness and love, Lord, that we could give glory to you through you. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that this could apply to our lives and we could realize the importance of growing closer to you and adhering to this instruction by Paul. Bless this time, Lord, and I pray for the preaching that you could just have your power in that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the next hymn. Take your hymnals once again and turn to number 733. Number 733, I just keep trusting my Lord. Yeah. <clears throat>
chorus one more time from the beginning. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk the Lord. Thank you, young people, for serving the Lord in song. Ruth Ann and Sandra and uh, Matthew and Andrew and Sister Jenna serving the Lord through the music ministry. Thank you all for reminding us of a gospel kind of love, his wonderful love to us. And as we thought about John 19 this morning, that was portrayed, greater love hath no man than this, but that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And so thank you for putting us in mind of the gospel. Before we get to the text this evening, I want to give you a few uh, announcements uh, that have to do with the relocation uh, for our Sunday morning crowd. Sunday nights will still be in here uh, uh, as the Lord leads us to continue to be in here, but uh, Sunday mornings will be over there starting Easter Sunday uh, in what we call our Family Life Center building, also known as our gymnasium, and uh, that is a work in progress over there. Every Sunday that goes by, we will probably have additional uh, benefits over there trying to duplicate what is here uh, into that building, and so a work in progress. Some of you have asked about Sunday school, um, and Brother Wasser, where is Brother Wasser? There he is. Brother Wasser is our Sunday school superintendent, and Brother Wasser and I haven't had a chance to talk privately. So Brother Wasser, let's talk publicly, okay? 
if you're okay with that. Uh, but uh, but uh, what I'm thinking, Brother Wasser, if you're okay with this, is Linda's class, his wife, so Linda's the real Sunday school superintendent, is what rumor has, but no, I'm just kidding. But she helps a lot, and we're thankful. But Linda's class is usually right in here. Uh, the Sunday morning ladies-only class is usually right in here, and it just makes sense as far as I'm concerned to have the ladies meet in the, uh, the new Sunday morning auditorium. Uh, so Linda and the ladies that are in her class, if you want to just plan on meeting over there at 9.15 uh, in that area there, that would be great. Um, other Sunday school classes for now, I think, are just going to stay right where they, they would be uh, normally. So wherever you're normally meeting, just go ahead and plan for that. Uh, we, we have high on the priority list a desire to connect the buildings undercover in case of rain. Uh, like right now in this building, if you need to go get a child from nursery, you can, or junior church, or you're coming from Sunday school from that building into this building, you can get this building to the uh, fellowship hall building undercover. But what we want eventually is to get undercover from this building or the fellowship hall building all the way over to the Family Life Center building. So uh, we can still use these buildings for Sunday school as we have need. Uh, and then, of course, in Pensacola, Florida weather, uh, rain just happens. It just hits, and you never know. And sometimes the meteorologists are complete, most of the time, the meteorologists are completely surprised and it just happens uh, according to the Lord's will, and we rejoice in that. Uh, but we want to connect to the building, so that's, that's something we're going to work on. Uh, but in addition to the lady Sunday school class being over there, all the other Sunday school classes, I think, pretty much should stay where they usually would be. But something that would then be over there that's different would be junior church. So we're going to try to use one of the, the rooms that Awana typically uses uh, just as a junior church. So on the, in the Sunday morning service, most of you know, uh, we usually will say something about those that are, I forget the age bracket, I've been doing this for six years, but those little kids, are get, they get dismissed and they get to go, instead of having them come all the way over to this building, you know, we just want to keep them in that building, I think that makes sense. And then also the nursery, uh, when you want to drop off your child for a 1030 church nursery, Sister Connie and I have talked a little bit about making one of those side rooms as well into a nursery, so she's trying to get items uh, to facilitate that. So a lot like we're duplicating what's over in this nursery, we're going to try to duplicate some things over there and just share those rooms with Awana. Um, so anyhow, we feel like the babies, the, the little toddlers in the nursery need to be close to where we're worshiping on Sunday morning as well as the junior church kids. Um, and then also the ladies Sunday school class will meet in that auditorium set up over there. Uh, and then... Oh, we wanted to mention this, that a lot of work has been done over in that building already as far as setting up chairs. Lots of you came and were a part of that and installing those uh, partitioning walls. Uh, there's work being done, I know, in addition, about, uh, as far as the platform goes. Uh, there's things that are still transpiring. But uh, if you're interested and have time to help clean aspects of that building, uh, some of the men that were at men's prayer breakfast yesterday were able to stay and help us take down some of the stuff on the walls. Most of you know we've leased that building, and we still lease it in a lesser capacity to the same organization, but with their permission, we've relocated some of their stuff and took stuff off the walls. Um, anyhow, what it has revealed is what you would expect, all the dust mites and all the ugh that just happens to be behind stuff when you move furniture. And so uh, if you're able to come and help clean, uh, 8.30 to noon, Sister Gibson is leading the charge there, so tomorrow morning, 8.30 to noon, anybody that wants to come and help uh, Sister Connie clean up the Family Life Center, uh, we sure would appreciate that as well. And um, so, yeah, those are the announcements. Anybody have any questions? Anything I should add to this? Um, okay, yeah, Susan. What do you think, Connie, over here? Okay, so good, good question. So the 915 Sunday School Nursery will be, yes, ma'am, over in the Family Life Center. Good. Any other? This is real informal. I told you, Sunday nights at our church are more like family, uh, a family feel, so we can dialogue a little bit about this stuff. It's a big deal to move over into that building. So if you have questions, um, the deacons have volunteered to help field some of these questions, too, or ideas about this. So see Dr. Ainsworth, uh, see Brother Herb, some of these other deacons, or you can come see me. Uh, see Mrs. Johnson, she has all kinds of fun ideas. So uh, anyhow, no, but if we can help answer questions, uh, then please uh, let us know what those are. Um, and it is a work in progress, so we appreciate your patience uh, with all of it as it unfolds. Um, oh, 
there's a note on here, and it's in bold at the top that says, please read this to the congregation Sunday night. <laughs> so here goes. Uh, we would like to decorate the Family Life Center next Sunday with live Easter lilies uh, temporarily donated to the church in memory of or in honor of a special person in your life. I think we've done this in years past, these Easter lilies. Uh, at the end of the morning service, the plant will be yours to take home. Plants are 8 to $12, depending on the size. See Karen Davis tonight if you are willing to help. Where is Karen Davis? There she is, way back there, waving. So see Karen Davis if you're willing to uh, help with this. And she will take IOUs to be paid next week. So that is very generous. You get a little credit extended from Sister Davis. So uh, that's always fun to have Easter lilies around Easter. So uh, getting them in uh, honor of somebody who's passed that you love is uh, certainly a good thing uh, to do in their honor. All right, Colossians chapter 3. Would you take the word of God and turn there, please? Colossians chapter 3, and I want us to consider just briefly tonight, I don't anticipate uh, a long message, but just briefly tonight, some things that pertain to the family of God um, from Colossians 3, primarily 12 through 17, but I want to point out other things in, surrounding, uh, in the surrounding content. But the family of God, it's, it's interesting for me to be able to say to our church, take the word of God and turn to a passage that's written to a church. Like, uh, we know that what is in this book and similar books in the New Testament, are, uh, these things are for us because we are uh, the church that calls itself North Stone and we gather here uh, and we'll be gathering over there on Sunday mornings. And, and we understand the church is not the building. Uh, the church is these that the Lord Jesus has purchased with his blood. And so we are relocating, sure, but we'll still, we're still the church, uh, whether we have a building or not. Uh, you think about these missionaries that gather in the name of Christ in these mission fields, and they don't have all the benefits that a 21st century American Christian has, and yet they're still just as much in the family of God as any of us. I find it interesting that there is so much here uh, for the church. Paul is, is uh, being moved by the Spirit of God to pen inspired words, and he is specifically writing to believers at Colossae. And the reason I have come up with this title for the evening, The Family of God, is because in chapter 3, 18 and following, there's a lot of instruction about the family, a lot of uh, commonly taught instruction about wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your wives and children obeying uh, your parents in all things. Fathers provoking not your children to anger. Uh, these things are things that are familiar concepts to the well-churched. And yet, honestly, they're very difficult sometimes to, to actually model and live out in our lives. And my wife and I have uh, recalled our, 21, uh, our 23 years this June of marriage and about 24 years of being best friends. And we recollect the first year of our married life we both could quote these, these kind of verses. Typically, we would quote them from Ephesians 5, but Colossians 3 here is a parallel passage. I mean, a lot of husbands know uh, that they are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Like, we can quote it, and she can quote, she could quote our first year of marriage 23 years ago, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, you know. But to actually do that, uh, it's a very different thing. So these are... Uh, instruction Paul gives to the church at Colossae, similar to instruction that he gave to the church at Ephesus. Uh, but what I find interesting is that uh, uh, sometimes, and I have done this, I will preach these ideas in isolation, but if you put them in their context, uh, you see that, that what is happening here is that the, the family or the home is to function within a, a larger context of the family of God. So the immediate family is given instruction in uh, 3, 18 and following, but the family of God in the larger context is given instruction uh, all around it. And all of these elements are important. Um, what I'm saying is that there is clearly an attack, maybe more significant attack than ever in human history on the family and on uh, the husband's leadership in the home and the wife 
uh, lovingly following her husband and leading her children and the children being in subjection. And I mean, there's all this blurring of the gender lines and there is this redefining attempt to, to redefine what the family is and, and what uh, you know, uh, the, the social structure of a society should be. And there are debates about uh, what is known as complementarianism versus egalitarianism. And that's the idea of how the wife and the husband function together. And I would identify Christian believers as uh, complementarianists. And and the two roles, husband and wife, complementing one another. And and yet the women's lib movement would promote the idea of egalitarianism. And and so, uh, so, so what I think is healthy for us to do on future Sunday nights is to walk through some of these ideas in kind of a punctuated way. What does it mean? What does verse 18 mean that wives should submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord? And then a separate sermon may be dedicated to husbands loving your wives. And I might might, uh, be vague about the announcements leading up to these sermons because, you know, the night that it's the wives' night, they might be sick that night, you know? And the husband's the same thing. So, uh, and the children are like, nope, staying home to play video games. I don't want that verse 20 uh, preached at me. But, uh, but, but, but really, uh, what I'm so- trying to say, this connection between the church family and the, you know, biological family as we understand it, as the church has kind of devolved into just entertainment centers, over the last century uh, in the United States of America, so has the family kind of devolved. And, and, and there is a redefining and a, and a devolution, you know. Uh, the, the progressives would call what's happening with the family uh, uh, from a, a sociological standpoint, the progressives would call that evolution or growth. But from a biblical perspective, we call it de- devolution, devolution. It's devolving. It's not progressing. It is... It is people doing that which is right in their own eyes. It is the heathen shaking their fist in the face of God, saying we're going to have a family as we see fit no matter what God intended. And, and a lot of that has happened within the ranks of the church as well. So like, yeah, this content is here and often preached in isolation, this whole family thing. Uh, The heading in my Bible uh, in the study notes here says domestic duties. I mean, it gives us the idea of what our homes should look like. But again, as the church goes, which is the surrounding content, so often goes the family. So I think it's healthy before we get into the idea of wives and, and husbands and children in their own messages. I think it's, it's wise, advantageous, uh, uh, spiritually expedient for us to consider some of the preceding content. So just briefly tonight, I want to put you in mind again of Ephesians. Ephesians 4 gives us the put off and put on. You know, I mentioned Ephesians 5, wives submit and husbands love. That's in Ephesians 5. So Colossians 3 and uh, Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5 have very similar uh, instruction because Paul understands both of these churches need this kind of instruction. And we understand in the 21st century that North Stone Baptist Church needs this kind of instruction. So uh, I think it's interesting, verse number 8, the idea of put off these things from Colossians 3. Put off uh, all uh, these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Verse number 9, another thing to put off. And again, you see these same ideas in Ephesians 4. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Then verse number 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Um, I had Brother Jared read uh, for us uh, verse 12 and following, and verse 12 says, put on, therefore. So if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you might mark uh, the idea in verse 8 of put off some things, the idea in verse 9, put off some other things, then the idea in verse number 10 of put on some things, uh, and then restated in verse 12, uh, put on some things. And so I may have missed one of the put-offs or put-ons, but you can uh, study that on your own and highlight all those things in your mind. Figure out what we are to be putting off and what we are to be putting on. Verse number 14 gives us another one of the things to put on, and that is charity. Um, and these are things that should describe the family of God. It's, it's the idea of put on what you are. Um, and I had him start in verse number 12 because verse number 12 gives us that idea. You wear if you will, we're talking about spiritual clothing, 
you put on what you are. Verse 12 gives us that idea. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. It's just a, we don't need to be alarmed by that phrase. It's just to say, uh, it's a reference to those that are saved, to those that are redeemed. Um, and we know that Paul believes that the Colossian believers are saved because of chapter 1, verse number 6. Chapter 1, verse number 6, he uh, references the gospel at the end of verse number 5 uh, in the word of the truth of the gospel. Then in verse number 6, which is come unto you. These Colossi believers, Colossian believers have received the truth of the gospel um, as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it. The it there refers to the gospel. And since that day, that you knew the grace of God in truth. And they learned the gospel, at least many of them, from Epaphras, uh, Paul's dear fellow servant. Epaphras was a faithful minister of Christ. So, so what he's saying is, put on that which reflects the gospel. Wear what you are. When he says to put on this uh, variety of things, he is describing what I have said from this pulpit many times. Some of you maybe uh, have wondered, what does Pastor Johnson mean when he says, and here's what I say often, is the implications of the gospel. Like once somebody has received the gospel, then we should walk in or live out the implications of the gospel. And it is a very natural thing to do that, to, to put on what you are. Um, and by way of illustration, I don't see... James Schutz here tonight, and if, he, if James is here, would you wave at me? He might be watching the live stream with Rebecca, waving in his living room, I don't know. Uh, but he was here the other day at the church, helping us set up uh, those chairs. I mentioned this morning, 263 chairs came, and uh, uh, probably 30 or 40 of you came and participated in that, Very uh, made it so much easier, very helpful. Uh, but James was among the group that came. And uh, it, how many of you know the Shuts? Would you raise your hand? Okay. So if you know him, you know that he's in the military. And he came to the church to unload chairs in what I think are called like military fatigues. Anybody know if I'm right? Is that what that's called? Okay, you saw him. Some of you saw him. You're nodding. I don't know all the mil military jargon. But he looked tough. He looked strong. Uh, I think that those, those uniforms are cut in a way specifically designed to make men look super strong. <laughs> you know, when they go into battle, we want to be intimidating, these American soldiers. And so, yeah, I mean, he just came in like he is ready to lift some chairs, you know. And it was totally natural for all of us to see him wearing those clothes, if you know him, because you know he's in the military. However, if I would have walked in that gym in those clothes... Uh, and Mrs. Johnson were to see me, she would say, what are you doing? You know, are you playing dress up? You know, uh, what? That's not who you are. It would be foreign. It would be odd. There would be questions. Um, and, and so what Paul is simply saying here is, is you put on what you are. It, it makes sense uh, to, to, because you've been saved. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, as the redeemed of God, you put on these things that are holy affections, that are things that reflect Christ-likeness. By the way, if you take time and, and study this out, the things you're supposed to put off, and you list them, and then you, ca and then you catalog the things you're supposed to put on, all the things you're supposed to put on are a perfect reflection of Jesus. All the things we're supposed to put off are world flesh devil stuff. Um, those things don't look right on the Christian. Um, but these things, Christ likeness, these things described here, they look right on the redeemed, holy and beloved. Notice this, bowels of mercies. We sang, I, I will sing of uh, the mercies of the Lord forever. Um, these are, uh, the idea of bowels here is just the, the innermost part of who you are. It's the idea of a genuine sincerity of, of mercies towards others and kindness and uh, humbleness of mind, verse number 12. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Like all of this is a picture of 
of Jesus. Kindness, humbleness of mind. Would you think about these aspects? I mean, you cite it in Scripture off the top of your head. Would you do that? Like, where does the Bible describe Jesus as humble? Philippians 2, for sure. Where is he extremely humble? How about John 19? We were just there this morning. I mean, this is a beautiful portrayal of Christ and then a call to Christians to, to wear what they are. To, to in the, within the church, to have this measure of forbearing for one another and forgiving one another and not being quarrelsome, quarrel against any. Don't do that. And just as Christ has forgiven you, you should also forgive others. It puts us in mind of Ephesians 4.32. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It doesn't look right on a Christian for them to be holding bitterness and ought against somebody else, somebody who is their brother. No, you go get that right. You work that out with people. It, uh, you understand that you're inhibiting not only your relationship with that person that you can't find a way to forgive, but you're inhibiting your relationship with Almighty God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me, Psalm 66, 18. Um, no, use Matthew 18 and go get right with a brother. Uh, maybe it's Matthew 5 that applies uh, and, and leave your gift at the altar and, and go seek out the brother that has trespassed against you and get these things right. But over and over in Scripture, we are instructed to forgive just like Jesus forgave. And, and of the sayings on the cross, this morning we considered, I thirst. One of the sayings on the cross is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiving like Christ forgives is to forgive somebody who's involved in killing you, in crucifying you. I don't know what it is that you're holding on to, uh, but if you're holding on to something, it, it, whatever it is, it's not killing you. You're here. You're seeing this, listening to this. It's forgivable is what I'm saying. What you put on as a Christian should be forbearing one another and forgiving one another. What we uh, endeavor to avoid as Christians is quarreling against any. No, just as Christ forgave, so also we should forgive because above all these things we put on love or charity, the Bible says. Charity. It is here in verse number 14 a reference to agape love. It is the love of God that should be extended to others uh, in a Christ-like way. And it is the bond of perfectness or spiritual maturity. Loving people even when they don't necessarily deserve to be loved. Because ladies and gentlemen, you don't deserve to be loved by God either. Neither do I. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Um, somebody described this idea of ruling your hearts as peace of God. It's to be like a like a referee in uh, maybe a basketball game or something, uh, if, if somebody fouls, you know, if somebody uh, isn't playing by the rules, they step out of bounds or whatever it is, the referee's going to blow the whistle and, and call attention to the, uh, to the thing that's disturbing the peace of the game. The, the peace is to be kind of like a referee. Uh, it should be ruling in our hearts. We should say, yeah, I want that perfect peace described in Philippians 4. I, I want to maintain that. So whatever I can forbear, whatever I can forgive, whatever I can choose to remember no more, even if they've transgressed against me, for the sake of the peace of God, uh, we're going to overlook these things. Because ladies and gentlemen, remember that, that charity, love, it covers a multitude of sins. Um, and there are some things you need to address. There are some things you need to deal with. But there's a whole lot that you can just cover. You can get over. You can forget and forgive and move on from. And verse number 16, uh, well, let me, note it. let me point out just quickly the idea of being thankful at the end of verse number 15. So there's emphasis here on, on these many attributes that are Christ-like attributes, but they all come from this idea of being genuine in your heart. It, they all stem from a gratitude, a gospel kind of gratitude in your heart. In other words, 
These things, again, are things that you put on because you put them on because they are who you are. You have been saved, bought by the blood of the Lamb. So it's easier uh, as the Spirit enables you to model these things in this way. But it is not some kind of front. It's not fake. You are genuinely grateful for what Christ did for you. And so you walk in these things. And what I, why, the reason I'm saying all this is because all of this then is, stands in contrast to to maybe like character development, you know. Uh, you ought to cultivate your character, you know, things like being on time uh, and, and getting up out of bed and just working on some of those things. And the Spirit can enable you in those things as well. But we would identify several things as just obvious, you know, character flaws or, or character goals. Uh, but, but it's not as if uh, Paul is instructing the Colossian believers to just have a better character. You need to forbear more and forgive more. No, when he includes this idea of thankful, he's saying this stuff needs to come genuinely from your heart. You need to be thankful for how God forgave you, and then it's just natural for you to forgive others and for you to love others. And in a moment, he gets into the wives submit and husbands love and children obey and fathers provoke not. Like, like all of those things continue, not just in the church, but then into the individual families that, that make up. Uh, the local church. In verse number 16, and I will conclude with some thoughts here, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And it says, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you're not regularly in the word, um, then you're probably not a very forgiving person. You're probably, if you're not letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you're probably not a loving person. If you're not letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you're probably not a thankful person. Uh, like, uh, to the extent that I pour myself into the word of Christ, then is to the extent that I'm in all wisdom, you know, walking in the implications of the gospel. When I was a teenager, more than now, but especially when I was a teenager, I had trouble with daily devotions. I had trouble reading and understanding the Bible. It, it is... A true thing to say that the Bible at times can be a very daunting book. But as, as an inner city teenager, you know what helped me a whole lot were the songs that they taught me at Calvary Baptist Church in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. And, uh, and through those Bible-based songs, they were teaching me lyrics that then allowed the word of Christ to dwell in me richly. And when I was aggravated at my sister's, or aggravated at my stepdad, or uh, my mom was disappointed in me, or uh, whatever the social dynamic was. I remember many times the Holy Spirit of God, at that time I didn't have a lot of verses from the Bible memorized, but I had a lot of songs memorized that were based on the Word of God. And I remember the Holy Spirit of God bringing to my remembrance song lyrics that He used to convict me, that He used to rebuke me, sometimes that He used to encourage me. At some of the darkest moments of my childhood. I mean, through tears, with the whole broken home thing and the abuse that Johnny Johnson doled out on the four children that were in that home. Like tears and fear. Some of the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that the people of Calvary Baptist Church sang with such gusto and Mark Monty led with reckless enthusiasm. I mean, those lyrics came right back to my spirit and to my soul. And it was as if the word of Christ was dwelling in me richly and enabled me to, to forbear and to forgive and to learn how to love through, through it all and learn how to be thankful for the gospel. Um, and then you get into wives submit and husbands love and children obey and uh, even servants obey and masters uh, being the right kind of employers. Um, all of this stuff is in view here, but, but as, as the church goes so often... The homes go, and it's all connected. So it makes sense that we consider this content before we get into uh, yet that which is to come. Would you pray with me, please? Go ahead and stand. So, Father, thank you for the timelessness of your word. That even though these words were penned several millennium ago, uh, they are still applicable for us today. Help us to put on what 
what is natural for Christians to put on, to be robed in the righteousness of Christ, that, that people would see Jesus in us, that we would be long-suffering, that we would be forgiving, that, that, that we would be Christ-like. And Father, forgive us when we're, we're instead walking in anger or in filthy communication or even blasphemy. Help us to put off those things that are, that are demonic and help us to walk a spirit-filled life in accordance with your word. I pray that all of us would hunger and thirst for righteousness so that indeed the word of Christ would be dwelling in us richly. We want to be like Jesus. We want you to continue to bless our church. We want you to do it for your honor and glory. Bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As she begins to play, Dr. Ainsworth will come. Number 548. Number 548. Have you any room for Jesus? So at every invitation, there are decisions that are made that need to be uh, kept private, but then there are some decisions occasionally that need to be made public, and the decision for church membership uh, has been made this evening, and so it is our privilege to uh, present for a vote to the church the Jones family, and this is Mark and Beth Jones, and then their son Robbie and Jake is over here, and we got to hear uh, their testimonies of salvation and how they have been biblically baptized everyone except Jake. So Jake, uh, contingent upon his baptism, and we talked about baptism, and he's praying about that. Uh, but so the rest of the family then we uh, present to you uh, with as a, as a statement of faith, understanding that Britton and I uh, have heard their testimonies, and my boys got to share their testimonies as well and hear the Joneses' uh, testimony. So all those in favor say amen, amen. and opposed say aye. All right, so right after, I know that was a, that was a hesitant, yeah, okay, but uh, that happens sometimes. Uh, but so right afterwards, uh, the Joneses will be right up here with my wife and I, and uh, so church, would you come and extend to them then the right hand of, of fellowship. Um, Brother Herb Jones, I got to be clear with the Joneses now, <laughs> would you come and close our service in prayer? Is there anything else I need to say before we dismiss? Don't forget church Wednesday night, and have I told you about this removing over there? Anyhow, okay. <laughs> I, I, before we close in prayer, I just want to share with you something that's biblical. The pastor will probably never preach on this, uh -oh. 
Uh, <laughs> way back in Genesis, when God created Adam and then created Eve from Adam, uh, he gave them a last name. Uh, it's not recorded in probably your Bible, but uh, it is in mine. <laughs> and that last name was Jones. <laughs> and that was okay until Adam sinned and Eve sinned, and God took away that last name. And I don't know, I think he gave the name Ainsworth or something. I, uh, I had a pastor in Connecticut whose name was Pastor Gary Jones. And Pastor Jones, when we joined the church, said everyone was named Jones. So you were once Joneses until you sinned. So we welcome you, too. It's an elite group. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you. Father, we love you, and thank you so much for the fact that we can share these things with Christians. We can have fun together, and yet, Lord, we can hear your word as it's preached to us. We're thankful for the ministry of our pastor. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the messages that he gives to us, Lord. And I pray that we would take these home this week and recall them and uh, use them, Lord, to help us have a good testimony around our, our world. And I thank you, Lord, for those that are here tonight. We pray that you give them safety as they travel home. Thankful for the Jones family as they join our church. We look forward to, to ministering with them. And we ask it now in Christ's name. Amen.